Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. The man who moves a mountain begins by carrying away small stones, is a quote by China's most famous teacher and philosopher, Confucius, whose ideas have profoundly influenced human civilization. I thought this was a fitting quote for our guest today, someone who built a business from a blank sheet of paper with a model that is disrupting the traditional system inspired by his travels to China. Our guest is Joseph Healy, co-founder and chief executive officer of Judo Bank, Australia's only challenger bank purpose-built for small and medium businesses. Joseph is a career international banker, having held executive positions at NAB, ANZ, CIBC World Markets, Citibank and Lloyds Bank prior to co-founding Judo Bank in 2016. He was previously Group Executive Business Banking at NAB and before that was Managing Director Global Client Relationships at ANZ. He is a Director of the Australian Finance Industry Association and previously served on the Board of Football Federation Australia. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners from all over the world, please don't forget to follow on your preferred podcast platform and share with your friends and colleagues. And for our listeners in Scotland, China, and New Zealand, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner at Blenheim Partners, Board and Executive Search. In today's discussion, we hear of the 87 meetings around the world four times over, driven by Joseph's unwavering resolve to challenge the long-established institutions. We discuss Judo Bank's unique approach to banking for small and medium-sized enterprises, the backbone of the Australian economy. Finally, and on a lighter note, he shares with us insights into his early days as a young footballer and how he crossed paths with the great Sir Alex Ferguson. So sit back and enjoy for the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Joseph, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Greg. What do you think of when someone says, no spring chicken? (laughs) Well, I find it amusing because when we were building Judo Bank, uh, we went to visit, we spent a lot of time in London Mm -hmm. speaking to investors, but one particular firm that acted as an advisor to to myself, David and and others as we're building Judo, said to me after several meetings, uh, he said, look, we have no question about the ability of the team to build a bank, but it's high risk. And the chances of failure are 90%-ish. So there's a good chance you could spend a lot of your time and a lot of your money, and this could end up pear-shaped. Yeah. So please don't take this the wrong way, because I do care about you, but you're no spring chicken. And there's other things you could be doing for the next 10 years that'll be a lot easier and a lot less risk. So, you know, when in early mid fifties, it was a wake up call. He said, of course I thought about that. So whenever I hear the term no spring chicken, it brings a chuckle to me because it reminds me of, it was good advice. It was make sure you know what you're doing because the chances of you failing are very high and you could destroy what has been a pretty good career to date. So why were you doing it, Joseph? I felt strongly about it myself and and David and others. We felt very passionate about the opportunity, the need to build a bank that would look after the interests of small to mid-sized businesses in Australia. 
So it was driven by a strong sense of passion and a strong sense of purpose. And, and also a life philosophy of no regrets. You know, we thought long and hard about this and said, look, I had other job offers, so I didn't have to do something like this and put at risk all that I had savings I'd built up over a long career. Mm. But there was a sense that, you know, if you don't do this, and in 10, 15, 20 years time, when you're sitting back on that Friday night gin and tonic on the porch yep. and looking back on your career, you're going to say, I missed an opportunity to do something. So my career was a, a career unfulfilled. So there was a strong sense of don't live that regret. Give it a go. If you fail, at least you've given it a go. You might be divorced and you might be in poverty, but you gave it a go. So that was the reason. It was live a life of no regrets. Believe strongly in, in doing this and give it the, your best shot. So that was, that was the thinking. What was missing in banking? I felt banks had lost sight of why they existed. I mean, banks play a hugely privileged and unique role in society. And in fact, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen that play out with uh, in the United States with the, with the government stepping in to allow an orderly resolution of Silicon Valley Bank. We saw that in, in Switzerland with the government stepping in to see an orderly resolution of the crisis that was at Credit Suisse. In most other walks of life, the government doesn't get involved and yeah. businesses that are badly managed take excessive risks, as was the case from the two banks I've just mentioned, they are allowed to collapse. But what we saw with banks, and the GFC was a great reminder of this, mm -hmm. is that in extremis, the taxpayer pays the bill. And banks lose sight of that. So I think that's an important point. The other thing is, I, and I know not everybody subscribes to the concept of social license, but when you're given a banking license, mm -hmm where the taxpayer guarantees depositors up to $250,000. Again, that adds to the privilege. Yeah. Banks had lost sight of their social license and of the unique privileges that that are bestowed upon them. And they, they were operating in a narrow shareholder maximization lens. It was all about how do we grow our return on equity? How do we maximize the value of the company? And everything else becomes a second order consideration, despite the marketing rhetoric. I felt, and I'd, I'd be very much part of that, you know, for 30 odd years, I felt that banks had really lost sight of why they existed and who they were there to serve. And that was a big motivation for building a bank that would show how banking could be done and the way that banking should be done in a way that society and customers expect the banks to behave. So that was part of the motivation. Is there another model similar to this anywhere in the world, Joseph? Well, I, I'm not aware of a bank that's similar to Judo Bank. I mean, I, I, I speak to investors and other banks around the world, so there's there's nothing that's quite like Judo Bank. Mm -hmm. um, there are banks that do have a strong sense of social responsibility. I, I, I'm not saying this is true of all banks, but in the main, in our economy, we have close to 85% of the banking system dominated by four giants. Yep. And as as we saw with the Royal Commission not that many years ago, they have not covered themselves in glory when it comes to their uh, the way in which society and the communities uh, evaluated them. They did really well when it came to shareholder interests. But I think you can look after your shareholders and look after your customers and be responsible in a community and not live in a world of trade-offs of or it's going to be a world of and 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 i think that's really important how often does, does a new bank come up i mean it's pretty rare isn't it's it? very rare in our market i mean there hadn't really been any new banks for several decades in 2019 uh, apra issued four new banking licenses that's right yeah uh, and this was part of an experiment i think about injecting some competition into an industry that really needed more competition okay sadly uh, three of those newly licensed banks are no longer in business, and the only one uh, that is in business and prospering is uh, is Judo Bank. So, you know that doesn't, to my mind, negate the need for more competition. I mm -hmm. think there's, it's very important that we have competition, not just in banking, but across a whole number of sectors in our economy. And sometimes businesses fail, and there's nothing wrong with starting something up and failing, as I mentioned earlier. Mm. 90% of all startups fail. Yep. 
Uh, I mean, those are the stats, give or take, uh, wherever you look at it around the world. So the fact that three out of four failed is not a big surprise. Yeah, right. But it doesn't mean we should therefore think the experiment was a failure. Okay. But as that gentleman said to you when you're sitting in London, no spring chicken, not being rude, but obviously sort of highlighting the amount of work ahead of you and the challenge ahead of you, you'd come from a, a pretty long uh, and successful career in banking. Why not take the next gig? Well, I, I felt that that the banking system wasn't working for, particularly for small to mid-sized businesses. I mentioned that earlier. And, that, is it, and was it really, really missing, was it? Oh, uh, really missing. Yeah, I, I feel that businesses were, I didn't really have much choice. I mean, sure, we had four big profitable giants in the market, but there was very little to distinguish them from each other other than their brands. Okay. And when you looked at customer satisfaction surveys and there are, there are 10 a penny in the market, uh, you couldn't find any survey were, that rated banks, SME survey that rated banks higher than three on a scale of one to 10. So there was a real deep rooted dissatisfaction with the way the banks were dealing with small to mid-sized businesses. So I, I felt there was a real need there. Mm -hmm. And it was that problem was not going to solve itself through the status quo. Um, despite all of the marketing rhetoric, there was a need to bring something new to, to the market that was a specialist, I mean, Judo is the, all we do, all we talk about, all we dream about, small to mid-sized businesses. Okay. But also a business whilst a new bank, a bank that was run by deeply experienced bankers who understood the craft of SME banking, how to do this properly, how to look after the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, yep. and how to think that profit is a byproduct of great service. It's not the primary motivation in business. If you look after your customer and you look after your employees, and you provide something that the customers can't get elsewhere, now, and a loan they can get anywhere. I mean, Judo's loan is no different from any of the big banks, but it's the service and it's the experience of the banker across the desk from the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, helping understand what customers are looking for and then solving their needs in a way that works for them. That had been lost to the banking industry, and that's why Judo was brought into existence. Okay, what do you mean by the service? Is it... Is it is it online? Is it face-to-face? -face? Is it all classical banking where I really take the time to understand your business or is that is that just rhetoric? Uh, for small to mid-sized businesses, people want to deal with a human being. They don't want to deal online. I mean, they, they'll deal with online for the routine matters and it's important that banks have, you know, state-of-the-art technology that allows people to, to do what I would call quite routine matters. But when it comes to the important events that businesses face every five years or so, like borrowing money to invest or thinking about succession planning or thinking about uh, expanding into new markets, businesses want to speak to someone who can listen mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. and understand what they're trying to do and then provide them with experienced advice on how that can be done. Now, what had happened in the banking industry is that it aggressively had shifted to a product sales culture and that it was about selling as many products that the bank had down the throat of and the I, customer. Because I'm incentivized to sell too, aren't I? I'm incentivized to sell. Yep. And it wasn't a question of tell me about what your needs are. It's a question of let me tell you how many products we've got that could be helpful to you. And of course, the butcher, the bacon and candlestick maker are not sophisticated in banking products. And if a banker says you should take an interest rate hedge or you should do that, so you should buy insurance, there's an element of trust that I think is essential in that relationship for the customer to feel that that advice is in my interests, not in the bank's interest. What had sadly happened in the industry is that it was the bank's interest that was dictating what the customer was getting rather than what the customer really needed. I mean, the Royal Commission highlighted this, um, that you know, banks had moved quite aggressively, I think, to being very product driven. How many products can we sell? And it doesn't matter whether the customer really needs those products or not. Let's see how many we can sell. And that ended up in significantly weakening the nature of the relationship between the bank and the customer. Uh, and that's what, one of the reasons why Judah was established, because we felt unashamedly when it comes to small and mid-sized businesses, that trust is really important. And you and I, when we go to our dentist or our doctor, we go there and we trust the advice that they give us about whether we need an operation or whether we need another filling. 
you implicitly and intuitively say, I trust this advice. It wasn't that many years ago that that was true of the relationship between the small business and the bank manager. Right. And sadly, that had been lost in the industry. And, and I'm quite unashamedly quite traditional in the sense that I, I'm a big believer in technology as it being important in providing a great service. And Judo is built on a modern technology platform. But when it comes to small to mid-sized businesses, the human interaction, the human judgment, the human interpretation of what the customer is really looking for, which is not always what the customer asks for. I mean, there's a great old line, a Woody Allen line that says, waiter, this isn't what I asked for, but it's what I want, right? Because again, small businesses are not experts in banking yeah, yeah. and they might think, I want a loan. Whereas the banker understanding what their needs really are might say, actually, you should look at some asset finance or some leasing, or you should think about this. But it has to be done on the basis of the customer's interest first, not on what is in the best interest of the bank. Now, good banks manage to balance those two things. I'm not saying that bankers should be doing things that's against the interest of the bank. That was clearly would be foolish. But your primary objective should be what is in the best interest of this business, of this customer of ours. And sometimes the answer is no, we can't help you because we don't think you should do that. And sometimes that's the best piece of advice that you, a business is ever going to get. Yep. But there has to be trust and, and you can't establish trust online. You establish trust face to face. And therefore in a world that is growing so fast towards trying to digitalize and online everything in life, I still believe strongly that when it comes to small to mid-sized businesses, that that human interaction is invaluable. And, and from a judo perspective, we will continue to invest millions of dollars in technology, but we will never move away from having a banker sitting across the table from the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, seeking to make sure that first you understand what they're trying to do, and then using your experience and expertise, telling them how the bank can help them. Why didn't you do this at one of your previous employers? That's a great question. I often get asked that. I mean, what I found in the banking industry, and this is true of all the banks, you know, I've worked in five banks in the past and I'm a great student of the industry domestically and internationally. The banking business model had shifted so aggressively uh, towards this product sales shareholder maximizing model that I described earlier. I found that in the organ last organization where I was on the executive committee, uh, I'd been on the executive committee for seven years, that I was a lonely voice in, in a world where it was all about how many products can we sell? How do we grow market share? How do we maximize return on equity? And of course, as a senior executive, I was myself and colleagues are incentivized to do that because our remuneration is tied to it. Yeah. So there's an inherent conflict sometimes but you know, at the end of the day, as an executive in a big bank, you've got to work in the interests of the bank. You've got to try and influence how that's done. But you know, the the whole culture in the industry, and this is not a statement about one bank, it's a statement about the industry, had so aggressively shifted that even in the executive committee in a number of those banks, and I can think in my own experience here, you were sitting in a room of eight or nine senior executives running a big bank, and you're kind of saying, how many bankers do we have in the room here? You know, we've got a lot of management consultants. Yep. We've got a lot of wealth managers who were, came from the wealth industry. We've got people who've come from the accounting profession, from the investment banking. But how many people sitting around the table here really understand the craft and the nuance of banking? And I would argue that when you look at the banking crises and even the examples of, that we mentioned earlier with Credit Suisse and and Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. now, Silicon Valley for, was totally devoid of, of experienced bankers. I mean, the sort of risks that they were running, which are well publicized, are one-on-one risks. And, you know, when I look at all the banks that got themselves into real trouble during the GFC, yeah. a common characteristic, both at the senior executive and at the board of directors, was the absence of, of um, experienced bankers. I was say, it's not just execs, it's in the boardroom as well, isn't the it? The boardroom, uh, actually, in particular, because you need, you need directors who know what questions to ask. You need directors that have a gut feel that actually this doesn't look right to me. 
Now, the reality is that in most of those banks, that the banks have got into difficulty, they didn't have people like that. They had highly credible people who were predominantly lawyers and accountants or investment bankers, but they did not have people that had a deep, deep instinctive sense for how the banking business model works. And I, I strongly believe this, that banks are very unique business models. They can go from being very strong to out of business in 24 hours. They survive on the confidence that depositors and funders have in them. Yeah, right. And if that confidence uh, is weakened, then the banks can get themselves into serious difficulty. And then, of course, you've got problems. You've got, because you're in the business of moving money around, you've got, you've got to make sure that your systems and processes are observant to the risks of moving money around that's illegal in nature. Uh, bad money, if I can use that term. Yeah, yeah. And there's a whole bunch of other risks. It's a business model that, that is littered with banana skins. And you have to have people who understand that. Not, not intellectually, but in a gut sense too. That, that I've said, actually, I don't think that's right. We should, we should stop doing this or we need to strengthen this aspect of the business because it's not an issue today, but it could be an issue tomorrow. And so let's spend the million dollars fixing it because if you don't fix it and it goes wrong, it could cost you a hundred million dollars. Now you need directors who really understand that. And the reality is that most bank boards that I've seen secondhand and firsthand have had very smart people without exception, very smart people, but not people who've got a deep instinctive sense of banking. You gotta fund it. You gotta raise capital. You gotta design this, this bank. When was all this sort of taking place? Were you employed at the time? Were you getting disillusioned? Uh, are you taking time out? When did it all happen, Joseph? David and I started talking about this in, in around about 2012, 13. Okay. It, largely because of sense of frustration on some of the issues that I had mentioned earlier, that, yep. that banks had become far too product-centric. They had lost sight of the customer. And, then, and this was industry-wide. Yep. At the end of 2014, there was a CEO change at the bank I was working at and I, I had aspirations but they didn't fall my way so I left this is a long answer to the question but mm -hmm. then I decided to take a year out on sabbatical and I went to China to university in China right. to do a little bit of teaching but also I wanted to study contemporary Chinese study going back to largely going back to 1949 but also go back to, to 1849 at the beginning of the opening war. So I studied China. I'd always been fascinated by China and I had done a degree in Chinese studies through the School of Oriental and African Studies at University of London years earlier. But I wanted to take a year out and immerse myself in China in a city called Ningbo, which is two hours south of Shanghai. Um, and it was during that time, because one of the beauties of a life at university versus life at an, ex an executive role is that you get your work done very quickly. You know? <laughs> You've done like two hours and you're you're basically done your work for the day and then you've got time to kind of think. Uh, and then I started thinking about the future. And I spoke to a couple of people and I said, look, I want to build a bank that was going to look after the SME economy. It's going to, it's going to do banking the way banking should be done. There was no precedent for that in Australia, but there were some examples in the UK, not perfect examples, because there was no example of anybody taking a blank piece of paper and building something. There were examples of people buying small banks and transforming them. Yeah, yeah. But I felt that, that it was longer to build from scratch, but faster to get to success because you, you're not dealing with legacy problems. And so we started thinking and then started planning about building this bank. Capital was always going to be a big issue because it's a hugely capital intensive business. Uh, but we knew that we weren't going to get any capital until we had built a business case, uh, an investment memorandum, uh, and that the people who behind the bank were funding it in its early stages. So that there was real skin in the game. So, you know, mortgage your home, pull your savings out, uh, invest in building, you know, when you, start, when you start engaging with lawyers and accountants and, you know, you can, you burn through money very quickly. <laughs> yeah, sure. But we, you know, we were quite strong in our resolution that we were going to make this happen. And we were very clear on what, what the bank, the purpose of the bank, because I say SME banking, not consumer banking or large corporate, it was going to be SME. We knew from the very beginning that we were going to have to raise one and a half billion dollars of 
equity capital. Again, there was no precedent for this, but we didn't want to come to market and say, can we raise 20 million? And then come back and say, can we raise another 50? Yeah, so we wanted to be really clear that this was a one and a half billion dollar ask over five years, and that we'd get the bank to profitability in three years. And that we knew how to build it through the technology, through people. And, you know, we then started speaking to investors initially domestically, but people said, really like you guys, love the story, but we can't see it working because the four big guys dominate the market and they'll kill you. We went overseas. We had 87, actually 87 meetings, uh, four times around the world uh, before we got our first dollar from a third party. And so the one big lesson, which I've outlined in a, myself and David, I've outlined in a book. Um, I hope you don't mind a, a promotion here. Go for it. Uh, the book is called Black Belt, which is a play on judo. Mm -hmm. But it, the book was written not to tell the story of judo, but to share our experience, experiences, the things that we got right and the things that we got wrong. And to do that in a way that you're adding something back to the community so that future generations of entrepreneurs uh, or, and people, including people in their, uh, in their 50s who think actually, you know, I want to spend the next 15 years doing something different rather than watching the clock click down to when I eventually retire. But say, actually, I'm going to be living for, you know, our average life expectancy now is in the high 80s. People are fitter than they've ever been before, healthier than they've ever been before. Uh, there's no reason why people shouldn't be working till the 75 if they want to but not being forced to stop because of a sense of being too old. So we wanted to write a book about this is how you would build a business from A to Z. Here's what to watch out for. Here's what you must get right. And here are the mistakes that we made. And so there's a huge educational component to the book. We use judo as a case study, but it's not a book about judo. But it, it does warts and all because the other thing that we felt really strongly about, if you're going to write something, you got to be honest. Don't write something that's a spin because people will see through that. But write something that's a true story with embarrassing moments where you, you know, you made huge miscalculations. But in doing that, help other people think about how they might build a new business or re-energize an old, tired business. So, and, and, and there's a huge university market for this book too, for students who are, you know, doing MBAs. And MBAs, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So it's, there's a, there's a, healthy sprinkling of academia not but it's it's written for the general reader so and that tells the story of all the meetings we had the frustrations the 87 meetings no money the times that we felt that maybe we should give this up i was going to say where, where are you at you, you're, you're in your 86th meeting yeah you got one more to roll into and probably i don't know first thing in the morning or last one of the day wasn't there but the confidence must have been starting to slide a little bit or is it not? When you're sitting down at the end of a long day in London or New York or wherever, and you and you you know you're enjoying a glass of wine, and you're thinking, "Wow, this is really really tough," and we burnt through you know three or four million dollars, and the prospects of success. And that's your own three or four million. Yeah, yeah, it's own money. Yep. The prospects of success are looking grimmer and grimmer. What should we do? And then of course you say, "Look, what well, we always said." we're not going to get into this having a plan B. We're going to have a plan A and we're going to make it work. And nothing in life worth doing is easy. You know, that's the one thing I've learned and I would, I would say most people have learned who've been successful that very rarely in life does it come to you. But the harder you work at something, then the more luck, opportunities for luck you create. I can't remember, I know Gary Player famously said it, the harder I work, the luckier I get. But I've always had a hugely strong work ethic. You know, I came from a working class background in Edinburgh, in Scotland, good family. Uh, dad was in, in the construction industry and engineering. Uh, we had enough, but we didn't have a lot. And so, you know, I'd always felt that if you're going to be successful, you've got to know how to work hard and you've got to believe in yourself. And you've got to know that the journey to success is not a smooth journey. There's going to, it's a roller coaster journey as, as the building of judo was. There's going to be highs and there's going to be lows, but you've got to believe that you can get there. And whilst we'd had 86, love the story, come <laughs> back when you made some money, um, there was nothing in the feedback that said this isn't a bad idea, right? 
Mm-hmm. There was not one case that anybody says. And also the other thing is I kept on saying David and I said, look, we've had 86 meetings. Like some people can't get any meetings. And the fact that you've had 86 meetings tells you something that people like the story. And and in the investment community, there's this old uh, line that, that when investors are looking at you, they're looking at the jockey and the horse. Yeah, it's going to ask, are they buying the plan or they're buying you? They're actually buying you. Right. They're saying, look, is a horse any good? Because they're not going to, uh, no, no matter how good a jockey you are, if you're if you're riding a nag, you've got no chance. Yep. But if the horse looks okay, they're saying, okay, I like the horse, but really this only works if the jockeys are any good. So they're, they're really looking at management and, and the people behind the company and saying, do you know what you're doing? Are you really passionate about it? And of course, they're never going to say this to you, but there's a thought bubble it says, well, these guys are in their late, at mid 50s. If the going gets tough, they're probably going to pack it in, you know? But at the same, we had already invested a lot of money, of our own money into the company, and we, and we were willing to invest more. So, what are you, pretty all in? All in. All in? All in. That's your future gone if yep. you get it wrong? Yep, 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 yep. Not gone, but. No, I'm not. Not, not yep. gone, but got to restart. Oh, restart. And, yeah. you know, when you're in your mid 50s, there's not a lot of runway in front. No. A failing would be mentally and physically exhausting. You've got to be up for this, right? Mm. The, anybody that says building a new business is easy is kidding themselves. Never done it, probably. Yeah. And the reason why I think a lot of businesses fail, startups fail, is that the people behind that haven't really thought through that this is going to be a roller coaster. There are going to be some great days and there are going to be some dark, dark, dark days when it looks like there is no light at the end of the tunnel and it's all falling in around you and weeks where you're not going to sleep because you're worrying about things. Things are often outside your control. Mm. So, you know, that's part of the journey of, in our case, building a bank. You've got to be up for it. So when that 87th meeting happened and said, I'm in, is the 88th, 89th, 90, 91st meetings pretty good thereafter? They got better. When we initially got the, the 87th meeting, when we when we had a, a major investor say, I'm in here, if, if you can bring some other investors in, uh, that was a big, big plus. But it's not done until it's done. And I can remember in late 2017, we had an agreement from six investors. Uh, and there was one lead investor who was the first one that said, I'm in. We had six investors who said, we'll put in aggregate $120 million into the company in two stages, Mm -hmm. $15 million each uh, pre-Christmas and another $20 million in March, April 18, subject to some conditions. So we said that's, we can live with that. And this is a process that had gone on for seven or eight months. And then on Christmas Eve, and I, I'll never ever forget this. So we had we we were supposed to get the first tranche of sixty mil dropping. On Christmas Eve, this representative of one of the investors whom we had never met, this representative we'd never met before, turned up and said the investor decided not to go ahead. And we said, "Well, why?" And no reasons given. Just changed the mind. It's a classic example of settlement risk, right? Even though the been in, 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 looked all through the documents, ready to go. At the last minute, they pulled out. The worry was that if one person pulls out, the others are going to say, what, is he, what do they know? And the whole thing could fall over. And of course, in that week between Christmas and 31 December is the worst week of the year to get anything done. But we, the others gave us that week to replace the 20 mil. Not a small amount? No, and a week. <laughs> and the worst week in the year. And the worst week in the year. Now, this is all documented in the book. I'm not going to mention names, but to cut a long story short, we got it. How'd you get it? We went back to an investor that we had been talking to earlier on who wasn't ready to move, went back to see him. Uh, he was great in the way that he made himself available. We spent every day and a lot of nights with that investor, getting him comfortable and then I think it was about the 29th or 30th of December, he said, I'm in. What did you say to get him in? I said, reinforced that this was a, the opportunity here was huge, that we had other big investors lined up. Now, when we had talked to him previously, we didn't have that. 
but we had named investors, you know, okay. people that were blue chip uh, and that they were willing to, you know, they were all ready to go. So he took a lot of comfort from that. The relationship was good. And this goes back to my earlier comments about face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. The fact that we had spent a lot of face-to-face -face time with this individual going back months and a year meant that, that you could make the call and he'd pick, he'd answer the call. Okay. And the story was the same. I I probably talked to him about a year, 15 months earlier. There was no change in the story. So consistency is there. The con, the, and, and investors love that. Yep. So, you know, he came in on the back. I think he took a lot of comfort from the, the names of the other investors that we had who were committed. And I explained to him some details about the investor that dropped out. I'm, I don't want to mention names here, but, you know, it was the most grueling, nerve-wracking and anxiety-driven week that I can ever remember. But we got there. And that was a huge sigh of relief, I have to tell you. <laughs> did you say something like, I need you or not? Yeah, I said, we need you to come in. You said it, did yeah, you? Yeah, 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 we need you to come in. We've been let down by somebody uh, for no reasons. And, and you, you can call, I said, you can call this individual. We've asked them why. And he said, just change of mind. Yep, yeah, can't get an answer. Can't get an answer. You're not going to be a big fish. And I can understand the other side of the fence that you're asking for a lot of money, 15, 20 million yeah. at a hit. Do small players make a big difference? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, mean, I think small players that have solid foundations can make a big difference. They can set the standard for how things should be done that big players can't ignore. We're never going to be the biggest. We have no aspiration to be the biggest, but we have a strong aspiration to be the best, to be the best SME business bank in this country that shows how SME banking should be done, that our customers, I mean, we've, we've grown our business now. It's, you know, our lending book is a few dollars short of $8 billion. It's been growing. We said to the market, we'll get it to 9 billion by June. It's growing very steadily. We're running our own race. Uh, we said to the market, we'll get it to $20 billion of lending around about 26, 27. We'll do that. We'll stay very true to the whole raison d'etre and purpose for the company. We're never going to change that. Okay. But we can set a standard as to how SME banking can be done and we can make a difference that way. Now, where, where we can compete with the big guys is in a market for talent because we're able to attract, I have attracted some outstanding talent. What do you mean? I would have thought you couldn't afford it. We can afford it. We say to bankers, do you want to work and help build a world-class SME bank where you're treated as an owner of this company, not as an employee in the company? So all of our staff have equity. We want an equity ownership mindset. Right. Uh, and, and then, you know, as a company, we've now got 550 staff and that'll be 700 in a year, 18 months time. But we want to make sure that everybody working in the company has some equity in the company and that the thinking like an owner, not an employee, that they're thinking that I'm here to help build something special rather than to be a clog in a big wheel. And that we understand customer service. And if you want to work in a bank that has its customers really front and center, not, not in a marketing campaign, but really front and center, where your experience really matters and where we'll back you to exercise your judgment with customers, uh, good people want to work in those businesses and they want to be able, you know, I, I keep on saying to good people, look, you can join us today and help us build a world-class bank, or you can try and join us in four or five years time when we already are. Now, do you want to look back on your career as a 25 year banker in a big bank as employee number 37,020, or do you want to be part of building something special? That's a no brainer for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and they look at the caliber of people we've hired. So this is not an empty campaign. They say, oh, I know this guy, I know that. This, as you know, it's a very small market. When you start building from scratch, are you setting the standards or is building the relationships to get these people in? How, how do you manage this? Because tricky one, you, as you said, you're a classic, you know, old style in that sense of high standards, yeah. critical thinking, I thought you were known for as well. Yeah. And you want as you say, the best service provided in this country. How do you go about the standards from day one? 
Well, you've got to hire very carefully. And when it comes to bankers and risk executives, we you know we go through the normal interviewing process, but we then ask them to do a three-hour closed door, closed book exam. We'll give them a case study. And we're testing the technical knowledge, but we're then testing their judgment around how they would think about something, how they would see risks and how they'd see how we might be able to do or not do a transaction. So testing thinking skills and testing judgment is a big part of the way that we think about hiring people into the company. Now, we've been running that exam for four and a bit years now, and we've never had a pass rate above 48%. So one in two people that have a good CV, interview really well, fail the test. And if you fail the test, there's no job. There's no a right of appeal, there's no doctor sick note, That's you've it. failed it. So you've got to keep high standards on hiring people into the company. And you've got to have people joining the company that you're, not, not just your brain, but your heart and your gut tells you are culturally a good fit for the company. Because the culture inside the company will define its success over time. I mean, I keep on saying to people that Judo's loan product is no different. I mean, a loan's a loan's a loan. Mm. So how do you differentiate this company? And we're handicapped by size. We're not a big machine. So how do you make a difference in the marketplace? And it comes down to your culture, which at its heart has the customer experience. It's first and second, third and center of everything you do. I was inspired by the story of a company called Enterprise Car Rentals, which you, you might have heard of. Uh, it was started by a guy called Jack Taylor in the late 50s. He was 47 then, which by at that time, that was a no, no spring. That was no spring <laughs> as well. <laughs> but Jack had been in the industry and was fed up with the industry. And so, right. and so he, he, he started his own car hire company against the Avises and the Hertz and you know, all of the big giants. Uh, and he didn't have the the space, the strategic space at airports that the big guys dominated. Yeah. But he believed passionately in customer service and making sure that when a customer came, and they, he started off with 17 cars, 17 cars. To cut a long story short, the market value of enterprise today is greater than the sum of the names that I've just mentioned in aggregate. Is that right? Uh, all he was doing was running a car, right? No different from the Hertz yep. offices, but the service was great. The customer felt there was a real experience there and the customers kept coming back. And so I keep on saying to our people, size does not matter in this business. We are a pure play SME bank. What matters is our service. It's the, it's the way customers feel when they're doing business with us. And if we get that right, then everything else will fall into place. Don't underestimate the power of great customer service. People will pay more for great customer service. But customer service is a cultural thing. It's not a company policy. It's about the people you hire. It's about the, people, the way you lead the company. That people hear you and they're looking at you. And they're saying, do you do what you say we should be doing? So they're looking for that. And inside our company, we've we've maintained that strong customer centricity and that service proposition as being so important to the way that we grow our company. You're listening to No Limitations with special guest Joseph Healy. On our next episode, I sit down with David Kirk, MBE, co-founder and chairman of Balador Technology Investments and former captain of the New Zealand All Blacks. When you cross that white line for training, go on the playing field, there's nothing else that matters but executing and training and playing and, and listening and being accurate and it's an old saying that it's not practice that makes perfect, it's perfect practice that makes perfect. Be sure to join us on our next episode. And now, back to the show. There's always a bit of a, um, a challenge here, Joseph, when you set up a business. You get a lot of wise old heads saying, well, look, you're not known yet, and you're out there building it, and word of mouth is one part of it, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you come in at your pricing, Joseph? Are you going to buy the market a little bit? You're going to be more expensive in the market because your service is going to be so great. Because as you say, you, you don't have any chances of getting this right. Yep. And if you go down too low, very hard to get back up. Uh, definitely. So what do you do? 
Oh, I think you've got to be clear in the proposition. As I say, the proposition is a service proposition. It's a relationship management proposition with experienced bankers. So it's not a price one? It's definitely not a price one. I, I mean, I've been in banking 30 plus years. Uh, I've never seen price strategies ever uh, succeed over time. They're campaigns, you can run them, but you, you they never succeed over time. You've got to be really clear on the service proposition and how you price for that. Now, so we're yeah. not the cheapest. I, I would say on average, we would be about 30 bips more expensive than the major banks. Yep. All right. On average. Yep. But you'll get a decision out of judo in five working days. You go inside the big guys, you're looking at five to six weeks. There's a big difference, right? Huge. Yeah. Now, if you're a small... And I need it when I'm a small business. Yeah, right? you don't yeah. want to be sitting... You want to be saying to a banker, this is what I need. How much is it going to cost me? What are the terms and conditions? Keep it simple so I understand. I'll have my, I'll have my lawyer look at it, but make sure I understand when can I have it? Because I want to buy that piece of equipment. I can't wait six weeks for it. I need some certainty. Now, the last thing that the small business thinks about is this the cheapest deal in the market. Mm. Is this a fair deal? And am I dealing with people who really care about my business? Yep. And, I, and I always think specialization, and that's as I talk about specialization a lot. When I go to my GP and I get, say, 15, 20 minutes of his time for 80 bucks, he refers me to a specialist and I get half an hour of his or her time for 600 bucks. I don't complain about that, actually, because yep. I'm getting a service that has a price attached to it. Oh, yeah. And so long as that service feels good, that I'm feeling as if I'm being understood and properly advised. So specialization, and as I said, we, we, we can charge a premium, but that only works if the service is up to it. And, uh, you know, we published our results uh, back at the end of February for the first half of the year. We published uh, a profit before tax for the six months of 53 mil, a net interest margin, uh, at 356 points. Now, the industry, by the way, of the major banks, the average would be about 200 points. Right, okay. Yeah. And a business that's growing. And a customer satisfaction score, which is in banking language is called the NPS. Yes. In the high 60s. 68 plus 68. The industry would do a high five if they got to zero. It's minus five. You know, I saw one bank last year in its annual report saying the best customer satisfaction amongst the majors, minus five, right? That's, that is a good result. You know, we've set our hurdle and standards much higher than that. But with a specialist proposition, you should get that. So, you know, I think people pay and value service in a world that has become so dehumanized. You know, I mean, if, if ever I've got to call a, a credit card company or a bank to get something done, my heart sinks. Yeah. I'll say, look, have, have I got three hours? <laughs> oh, you know, I'm going to speak to somebody I never met and it's going to be random. And I'm going to get told to go online and do this. And I, it doesn't work for me, and I, you know, and you're looking at the thick end of half a day. You an entrepreneur by background? Because I didn't see it in the CV. Uh, well, I'm a career banker, but I've always had an entrepreneurial gene. I mean, people who have worked with me have always said that I've had a, a maverick personality, always trying to do new things and grow things. But I've always done that inside big institutions. How did you handle it? You must have been frustrated. Frustrated. So I, I've been in five of them, and that's partly because you get to a point where you get quite frustrated that you can't, it's difficult to get things done. Yeah. There's more people trying to tell you why it can't be done and help you get it done. And some of these big banks, you, you know, and I say this to people who, you know, who've got great new businesses and they're thinking of joint venturing with a big bank or being acquired by a big bank and say, good luck to you. You know, good luck to you. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you not to do it, but I'm just going to tell you what to be aware of because yeah. you'll, you'll be the, the poster boy for a month if you're lucky. And then the overheads will come visit you. And then you'll find there's going to be seven or eight people blocking you instead of supporting you. There'll be people lying. And if you get past the blockers, there's more people lying in the long grass. And that's just the nature of these big bureaucratic machines. They move really slowly. They are hugely risk averse. Uh, ironically, they make more risks than they should because if you have a culture, highly bureaucratic, slow moving culture, 
you're prone to making lots of mistakes. So I've never been at home in that kind of environment. I, I like decisive people. I like getting things done. You make mistakes, There's nothing wrong with making mistakes. If you deal with them quickly, I'm not into a blame culture. If I see somebody trying to do the right thing and it doesn't work out, I would say to them, well done. What did we learn? Let's go again. You get killed inside a big bank. If you make a mistake, you're likely to get, you'll definitely get your file marked and a good chance you're, you're going to be out the door. So uh, they are not entrepreneurial organizations, but they do have some entrepreneurial people inside those companies. Uh, and I'm not, and bureaucracy is a feature of fact of big business. Yeah, yeah. But I liken bureaucracy to, to cholesterol. You need good bureaucracy as in you need good cholesterol in your body. You need to keep the bad cholesterol or bad bureaucracy to a minimum. The reality is inside a lot of big companies, the arteries are clogged with bad cholesterol. They move slowly. Uh, the lack of competitive tensions makes it easy for them to operate that way, you know. And this is a feature of the Australian economy that we don't have really competitive industries. And so ordinary, slow moving, non-customer focused companies can prosper in such environments. Customer service deteriorates. What customers do is they readjust their expectations lower. Yeah, right. And then you lose confidence and trust. You say, I'll deal with them because I have to. I'll buy this airline ticket because actually I've got no other choice, mm. you know? So I, I think that's a sad state of affairs. Uh, you know, I, I'm maybe a little bit idealistic in this sense, but I do believe that good businesses can really survive by doing the right thing by customers. And you can make yourself really profitable doing that. And I, Judah's still a young company, but I could not be happier with what we've done so far and the runway in front of us, but we've got to stick to the purpose that established this company and never lose sight of why we're here. How do you conduct yourself then as one of the leaders of this, of this group? You know, as you said, I, I may have come from another bank competitor. So I've been around the block potentially. Yep. Pretty good. I'm investing. Not only just my time, but my potential income as well. Oh, and I hope that it's going to be returned by an X factor. But gosh, I must be watching you to see if this is a good investment. What am I seeing back in terms of leadership? Someone who is deeply passionate. Yeah, there's a lot of deeply passionate leaders who couldn't organize a- someone who, someone who knows the business inside out. I mean, I've been 35 years in the industry, different banks, not just in one place, in different banks, done a whole range of jobs. I know this business A to Z. I'm deeply passionate about the role of banks. I'm not proud of the way the banks have conducted themselves. But that doesn't negate the important role that banking has to play in the economy. So I'm passionate about that. Uh, I have been since I was at school. And I believe that there's an opportunity with Judo to build something very special. I have never been more excited in my career than I am today. I keep on saying to people that, you know, back in the early stages of my career, I, I could hardly sleep. Not because I was worried about anything, but I was excited. I just couldn't. I was looking at the clock saying, when, you know, when can I get up and when can I get into the office? Uh, because you just want to be part of it. And it was a, it was a healthy mm. stress, if I can call it that. And I feel the same today. I just, you know, uh, I just can't wait to get in and see the team. I can't wait to get into the business. You know, when you're doing something you love, it's not like work. It's not like, I don't, I, I, I'm the CEO of a growing bank, but I don't feel like I'm working. I feel like I'm doing something that I really love and that it's delivering what it said it would deliver. Do you lead differently to what you saw from the others? Oh, definitely, definitely. I, I think um, I lead, I'm very visible in the business. Like people can come in and speak to me at any time in the business. I own my own communication. I'm not into spin. I mean, the one thing that I used to hate inside large companies was somebody saying, look, here's your speech. And I, I don't talk like that, right? And so you've got to say this. I'm not saying that, uh, you know. I, because there's nothing more as a turn off when you listen to someone, you say he or she doesn't mean any of that. Yeah. And you right. see through them all. They see yeah. through them all and you just switch <laughs> off and you say, oh, that's what the right thing to say. It's not, the right thing to say is to be, you've got to be sensible and measured, but transparent and write the way you talk. So when people read something, yeah, that's exactly how he talks. Okay. You know? So no spin. I hate spin. Hate it with a vengeance. 
I think be really clear, put your hand up when mistakes are made, yep. get to decisions quickly. And it goes back to the thing that I used to find frustrating inside the larger organizations that it, they move slowly. Whereas in, in a judo environment, I'll say, well, you own that decision, you own that decision. I'm not always going to agree with everything you say, but I'm always going to back you. Right? I'm not interested in opinions. I'm, I want feedback, but I don't want people saying, I think we should do it this way because I like it that way. So, well, that's his decision. Let him make it and get behind them. Or that's her decision. Get behind her. So I think the ability to make decisions and own the decisions is one of the big strengths in the company. If people want something, they can contact me and I'll say, yeah, that, that's my decision. Or go speak to Chris because I've asked him to look after that. But we'll make a decision quickly. This must have been one good trip to China all those years ago then. Well, it was time, you know, in life it's so important to get off the busy dance floor of the day-to-day -day and onto the balcony so that you can look over things, take stock of what's happened and take stock of where you are and take stock of where you want to go. You can't do that on the busy dance floor of day-to-day. -day. So that year uh, that I had in there was, not only did I immerse myself in a passion, which is China and its role in the world, but I could also reflect on where I wanted to go and how I was going to do that. Like not everybody can take a time off, but I, I have advised people who've left big jobs. And of course, the first thing they want to do is find another big job. I say, big mistake. Big mistake. Take time out, right? And, and if you can, get out of town. Because if you're in town, you're going to, your mates are going to be calling you up. Yep. And the organization you left, you'll never leave because yeah. you get dragged back into it. And you listen to gossip about that was a bad appointment. That's like, cut that umbilical cord, move on, get get out if you can. And I I let I, I I'm jumping on a plane I'm off to China. I'm going to spend a year. I'm going to do some academic work which I'm really interested in, and I'm going to map out the rest of my career, which is exactly what I did. What did we learn from China? About China itself, China. I think China is greatly misunderstood in Australia. I, and in the West, generally. China is a huge civilization. You know, it's one in four or five, five people in the world today. It's It has a history that goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Mm, about five, isn't it? 5,000 years. It's a country that was badly treated by the world, I would say, at least from the mid-19th century, from the 1850s on. The Chinese talk about the century of humiliation, which was the, the century up, up well, from 1849 to 1949. Yep. Uh, the Chinese see themselves not as becoming the biggest in the world. They see themselves going back to where they once were. You know, this is not them trying to gain ground they haven't once occupied. I'm not saying that they don't represent a threat, but I am saying that the rhetoric around China is very shallow and fails to understand the Chinese. And I, the one lesson that I have learned in life, and it's one piece of advice I give everybody, is before seeking to be understood, seek first to understand. Listen and understand where that person is coming from. And once you've done that, then express your views. But how many times in life, and I do this happens to me a lot, where I jump to a conclusion on something, and then when I learn a little bit more, I think, oh, God, I got that wrong. You know, I got that wrong. Um, so, but people jump, emotionally jump to conclusions because there are biases. And, of course, the media doesn't help mm. because of, just because of the sensationalization and the demonization that we read about China. And I, I feel that the risks to the world are increased when people don't understand each other. When you do understand each other, at least you have a basis for talking. And and what I'm hearing today in the West, it, it worries me a lot because it's antagonistic. It's not an engaging rhetoric. It's a China is a big bad bogeyman. Mm. Uh, and, and I feel that that's there are very few people in Australia. There are some people in Australia. I'm talking about statesmen and senior people who can talk about China with some degree of authority, but they are a, they're a very small minority. The rest of the people I hear reading and talking about China have real no understanding of China or the Chinese history. So were you disappointed when you look at the Western newspapers compared to 
Were you sitting in China? Uh, I didn't. I didn't read. I didn't read much of the Chinese newspapers because no, no, no. Did you read the? But you read the Western newspapers yeah. sitting in China yeah. and then engaged in what was it a third tier city? Yeah, a, yeah, third tier city of nine million people. <laughs> okay. And I purposely went there, by the way, because I could have studied in Beijing or Shanghai. But you go to Shanghai or Beijing, the temptation to get into the expat community is enormous. Whereas you go to Ningbo, which is a third tier city, nine million people, and outside the university campus, nobody speaks English. So you you sink or swim, you know. Yeah, right. And so and I wanted that. I wanted to I wanted to feel really uncomfortable. I mean, I can remember on the first week there where I had to go myself and other students had to go to the police station to register. And of course you've got all these other students who are probably in their mid twenties. Mm -hmm. And then they're looking at me, and of course all these police <laughs> all these policemen are gathered around thinking I'm something other than what I say on the form. And uh, you know, there was a lot of inquiry about what are you doing, why are you here? And then I had, a, for the whole year, I had a minder. Oh, really? Yeah. At whatever class, she would follow me. I mean, she was very clear that I've been asked to... Member of the party? Be member of the party. Yeah, well, yeah. you couldn't have a classroom in the university without one party member being in the class. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, so that was just part of the, the structure of the system. But, you know, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how the Communist Party works at the grassroots as well as... And, and I learned a lot about the culture and the thinking of people, which is really important. But I was deeply uncomfortable for a while. But that's what I wanted because I think too often in life, particularly when you're reasonably successful, had a good career and you've got some money, you're looking for things that are comfortable. And I wanted that to be uncomfortable because I'd been too comfortable for too long. Did you take anything away from trying in the sense of ethic, creativity? Huge work ethic, hugely entrepreneurial people. I mean, you know, people talk about communist society. It doesn't seem to stack up, does it? It's, they are the most entrepreneurial people you could ever, ever come across. Huge work ethic, an ability to navigate incredible local bureaucracy. Uh, you know, the, the Communist Party at the grassroots level running, you know, towns and villages, hugely bureaucratic, often quite corrupt people acting in self-interest, bribes, all the sort of things that you, you don't want to hear about, but it goes on. Uh, but the entrepreneur navigates that to get things done. And we've been a huge beneficiary in Australia of wealthy Chinese people coming here yes. and, and, and buying property and, and setting up businesses. So I, I left with a huge respect for Chinese people and I, and I separate the Communist Party from Chinese people. And, and, the, and actually, the Communist Party is not a Communist Party at all. It's an authoritarian party. It's a state control. But it's miles away from, from the socialist principles of Marxism, Leninism, miles away from that. It's an, an autocratic authoritarian state, uh, miles away from the communist principles that spices. Well, if you come back home, are we, are we living in a capitalist society? Because we're the land of duopoly. Yeah. And if I look at, you know, some of the senior leadership in the country... Is there really a lot of efforts to make change? I think the world has changed quite dramatically on us. Um, and I would say that that started changing at the time of the GFC, but it had been changing progressively since that. We, we've we gone away from that era of market capitalism or free markets, the, the kind of Milton Friedman, Maggie Thatcher, Ronald Reagan mindset that let the markets dictate to a world where and increasingly, and I don't see this changing, where the long hand of government is everywhere, is everywhere. You know, capitalism, unfortunately, has not shown itself up in its best possible light. There's been some pretty ordinary behavior inside the capitalist system. I, I don't believe there's anything wrong per se with capitalism as it was originally espoused. But what has happened with industry, monopoly, duopoly, oligopoly style structures is that uh, the forces of markets have been dominated by the few to the disadvantage of consumers. And I, I think that's giving capitalism a bad name. But I would argue that that's not the capitalism that we all, that Adam Smith and, and others over time have felt was in the best interest of society, which I, I fundamentally still believe to be the case. But the reality is that world is gone. And I would say that period from, let's say, the late 70s, 80s, through to the GFC was a 30-plus was a year aberration. 
that we're now back in a world where the government is everywhere, where we're living in nanny states in, in certain parts of the country where you, you're told what you could do. There's red tape everywhere. Um, and it's a world that is, you know, people are adapting to, but government's only get, going to get bigger. And, and the, I think the, the COVID crisis, which, you know, required government to step in with fiscal and, and monetary stimulus only furthered the hand of government influence in the way society will function into the future. I think that's the world we're in. It's not just an Australian problem. No. But, you know, for the entrepreneur, for people who want to do the right thing and build, it's a little bit disheartening because it's going to become harder. As a banker, will you pay too much? And what I mean by that, I'm not being smart. It's a well-paid sector, as we know. It's probably between that and mining is the, probably the best two sectors in the country. But if I'm not seeing a lot of creativity, and you're saying I'm not even getting great customer service, I'm not seeing a lot of enormous change in risk-taking, okay? Or oh, maybe I am. I must maybe missed it. But what do you think? Are you incentivized to make, you know, you're talking about bureaucracy left, right, and center. Well, how's that allowed to permeate and stay on and on and on? Well, I mean, there is no doubt. And they, and they get paid a fortune for and, it. And, yeah. and execs, not one level, two levels, three, four levels down, get paid bonuses yep. for it. There is no doubt that the banking sector is well, highly paid, highly paid. And for the reasons that I touched on earlier about, you know, the, the social license and the privileges that are in the industry, the yep. fact that actually banks can't fail because the taxpayer will always step in. We saw that uh, with Silicon Valley and with Credit Suisse. The reality is that senior bankers are well overpaid for what they do. There's no doubt about that in my mind. I mean, they're heavily bureaucratic jobs. They, the reality is that, you know, that in a lot of these jobs, you could go away for nine months and you'd still be making pretty much the same amount of profit because it's, it's locked in the system. You know, and you don't see many entrepreneurial moves. You, the, the major task is to make sure there's no mess created. Nothing goes horribly wrong. Okay. But for what they do, yeah, I would, I would say that bankers are, senior bankers are way overpaid. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to be very unpopular, by the way, with some of my good friends, but. you got all that experience. You're out there. You come back from China. You've caught up with your colleagues. We're going to hit it. What year was it you decided to take action? to start on the, the business. Itself. 2016. All right. Has it exceeded beyond expectations? Yes. Was it more difficult at times? Yes. Much harder than I thought. Because again, this is not something I'd ever done before. So it's not like you can say, actually, when I, five years ago, I did this. This is, this is a classic example to quote a very famous Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping. This was a case of crossing the river by feeling for stones that there was a bit of trial and error, you know, that there wasn't a playbook that you could follow. Um, you had to be very agile in the way that you were going about things. We realized that. We said, look, this you, we can plan. But plans per se are actually can be quite futile things. But planning is indispensable. So it's the effort that goes into planning as distinct from the plan itself. Because the planning will look at all different scenarios. And what happens if this doesn't work out, we would do this. What happens if that doesn't work out? Now, that might not make its way into the final plan, but the amount of effort that goes into planning, a philosophy of measure twice, cut once, oh, which, yeah. which is something that my banking experience has definitely taught me, that don't rush big decisions, big decisions, uh, measure twice, cut once, take the time to get it right, because mistakes made early can be defining to the future that they can be fatal. And it's something that we bring out in the book that don't rush into making big decisions that are going to be critical to the future of the company. Easier said than done when you're burning capital, left, right and centre. Easier said than done. But again, you you kind of, you, you think this through and you say, this is the journey we're on. It's not always going to go to the timeline that we said. You've got to build that into your way that you think about planning. But if you rush into a bad decision, and I can think of bad decisions that we made, you know, that with a bit more time, we would have made a different decision. And technology is a classic example. Yeah, you know, I mean, this is not just true of new businesses, but true of established businesses, that businesses rush into technology decisions largely on the back of expert advice from a technologist 
when these decisions should be owned by the CEO and the senior leadership team of the company. And so I think, and there's other examples, but I think the experience taught us to think about these things in quite a measured way, but still being very entrepreneurial in the way we get things done. And there's no contradiction in that. And how are you going making decisions about the full facts? That's entrepreneurism. Again, you rely on your gut and your instincts and, you, and the vision that you have for the company. You know, so there's a combination of, of emotions that take place yep. in your mind, but you never lose sight of the vision because in those dark days, as I mentioned earlier, there's lots of these dark days. So dark, dark days being where you, you couldn't pay to get the payroll sorted? Or couldn't what? get the, we're running out of money, couldn't pay the payroll. Oh, really? Uh, promises that were made, not kept. Things that are outside your control. The walls are closing in on you. Can't see any way out of it. Had those, had several of those. Weeks, not just days. Um, what gets you through is you close your eyes and you go back to the vision of what you're building. And you never lose sight of that. And you say, no, we're going to get there. We're going to make this happen. No plan B. I think when you're building a new business, a plan B is a big mistake. Now, a lot of people might say that's a nonsense, but actually I do, because you go to plan B quite quickly. So burn the boat? Just go for it. But you've done your homework. You've thought about the business case. You've thought about all the angles. You've measured twice, cut once. You've said, this is how we're going to do it. Here are what could go wrong. If this goes wrong, this is how we'll do you need the right team. These things are never built by one or two people. You need to have a high caliber team. So your ability to attract um, real talent, people that are every bit, if not better than you, attracting that talent into the company makes life so, and reduces risk so much. Uh, too often you see an entrepreneur trying to do it on his or her own. Big mistake. But sometimes they have personalities or egos that make it difficult to work with. So one of the things that was important to me and David and others was making sure that we had people uh, that were culturally very similar. Not same peas in the same pod, but, but had the same fundamental values, different complementary skills, different experiences, but we felt were culturally aligned with what we were trying to do and who were team players. And the one thing that I watch like a hawk when it comes to the culture, as soon as I hear somebody saying, I did this, or I'm going to do that. I said, you know, we are not an I company, we are a we company. Don't use that language. Language is one of the big insights into culture. And the people start saying, look what I've done, or look what, you know, say, this is an organization that is built on four fundamental values of teamwork, trust, performance, and accountability. The teamwork and trust is critical. As soon as you start saying, my targets are, you don't belong in this company because you should be talking about our targets and how we're going to work together building a great bank. Now, the culture inside the large organization doesn't allow for that. Inside a large organization, it's, I'm going to get to my numbers. Right. I don't want that. That's why when you're building something from a blank piece of paper, you're not dealing with all that legacy, cultural legacy. You say that this is an organization that's based on a strong sense of purpose, on a strong set of values of which teamwork and trust is really important. And if you struggle in that organization, then you, you don't belong here. So if I winded back a long time ago, when you were a young lad, was it under 16s? Yep. And you're playing for Scotland? Sco yep. My career aspiration was to be a footballer. And how good were you? I was good, but I wasn't great. I was good, but I wasn't great. I, I did really well. I, I was captaining the, the, you know, the youth team, the captain of the Edinburgh under 15, under 16, under 18 team. I got into the national team, uh, which was a great achievement. And I went to I went to trial at a number of clubs, including Arsenal. Uh, I really wanted to be a footballer. It was all I'd really wanted to be since I was four or five. But the reality is, and, and I think I realized it when I was about 16, that I was looking around and there were a lot better players than me. I was good, so I held my own, but I didn't have that X factor that I saw in others. And I think I did as well as my talents allowed me to do, right? I, I probably outperformed given my talents, but I did that not through, I'm being self-critical here, but I did that not through natural skill, but through sheer hard work. Okay. Yep. Uh, that I had, I had some talents and I worked really hard at them, but it wasn't enough to take me to where I wanted to be. And so 
there was a realization when I was about 16, uh, even though I was in the, in the national team, one of the highlights of my life, I met Alec Ferguson. He was the assistant coach at the senior national team. Okay. He, was, he wasn't he was as famous uh, then as he is now. He was um, the manager of a Scottish club called St Mirren, but he was assistant to the national coach and the national team used to play on the Saturday and the youth team played on the Friday. So he, they, the national coach and the assistant coach came to see the youth team on the Friday and Alex Ferguson, um, who whilst he wasn't as famous then as he is now, he was still well regarded in, in certainly in Scotland. And uh, I look at him uh, as a absolute role model of determination, of a strong sense of self, um, no arrogance. I mean, he may have developed arrogance over the years, but a huge determination to be successful and a significant ability to deal with failure because he was sacked from a couple of his early jobs. And almost was sacked in menu as well. Almost sacked in menu. But what did he do? He said, I'm going to prove these people wrong. I used to look back at that as a kind of a Scottish thing because it's not just a Scottish thing, but back in those days, because yeah. that was the lens of the world I had. His determination to be successful was inspirational. You know, I see that today, staying with soccer, I, I look at Ange Postacoglu at Celtic in Glasgow, but I also look at what Ange did for the national team here. Uh, what a great role model in determination. So, in, so leave nothing on the ground. Leave nothing mentality. on the ground. Be yourself, you know, and don't apologize for it. Be yourself, be true to yourself. And work hard. And then because what these people are looking for is not the most talented people in the world. You've got to have talent, but they're looking for an attitude that, that says, I'm here to help the team and I'm going to work as hard as I can to make the best of whatever gift I've been blessed with. And I'm attracted to that. I'm attracted. I'm not attracted to the best and smartest in the room. I'm attracted to people who are good and who want to be much better. I'm attracted to people who are really want to make sure that they leave nothing on the table, that whether it's in, in their professional life, in a bank or anywhere else, they say, look, when I finally leave what I'm doing, I can look back and say, I gave my best shot. Might not have achieved everything that I wanted to achieve, but I gave it my best shot. There is nothing more energy draining than working with people who are not doing that. You know, people who are cruising. Yeah. Uh, and I, so I watch that like a hawk, right? I'm not expecting people to be working 10 hours a day. I, I want a healthy lifestyle. But I want, I want people who, when they come to work... Committed. Committed. Yeah. And if I see people who are, are not feeling that way, then I don't want them. They're better going doing something else. Because I, I think one of the big lessons that I learned in life, again, it goes back to early advice. There's a concept in economics called opportunity cost, yep. which I actually think is the most powerful concept in economics, the most powerful concept in business. The opportunity cost is what the next best alternative to what you're doing or the investment decision you're going to make. What is the opportunity cost of that? What could you otherwise be doing? Uh, now, in life, you say, what is the opportunity cost of the decisions that I make? In all walks of life. I, mean, I, I think when someone says to me, just for fancy going off to a, a long weekend somewhere, I'll say, oh, that sounds really great. What's the opportunity cost? Of that? Right. <laughs> yeah, or, and, or what am I going to do next year? What's the opportunity cost of that for me? And I, I encourage people to think like that. I, th I think it's the one single most powerful gift that economics has given to the way we should be thinking about it. You don't have to be an economist, but you should be thinking, what else could I be doing? How else could I be using my time? If I spend my hard-earned money on a house down in the Southern Highlands, I'm going to be, but what else could I do with that money? You know, and think like that. Um, it's easy and it's powerful. Judo, where's the name come from? Well, it's a great question. The name came from the business strategy that we wrote uh, back in 2016. We gave it to this dear friend of ours, a guy called Vimpy Junja, who... Unfortunately, the age of 52 passed away. Shocking. But Vimpy was a, a management consultant who, Harvard MBA, 
very strong strategic thinker, uh, always very honest. You know, when you asked him for a view, you should fasten your seatbelt because <laughs> it was an unvarnished view, always constructive. But we said, Vimpy, look, here's this business case. Can you read it? Don't tell us what's good about it. Don't tell, please don't do that. Tell us the gaps, the blind spots, the weaknesses in the business case. So he came back after a week. He said, this is a classic judo strategy. I never heard of judo strategy, nor had David. We Googled it and there's an academic literature on it. And judo strategy, uh, it talks about the art of a new entrant, small new player coming into a, a market dominated by giants and using the techniques of the judo sport, I mean, fast, agile, uh, using the size of the big guys against them because they can't turn. And he says, this is a classic judo strategy. And we thought, brilliant, let's call the bank judo bank. And then, of course, we thought there's going to be a patent or a trademark against our ability to do that. But to our pleasant surprise, there wasn't. Uh, we've had some copycats. There was a bank, uh, not a bank, but an emerging bank in London that called itself judo. And we, we took legal action against that. But uh, there, is, there is an extensive literature on the art and craft of judo strategy. And that's exactly what judo is all about. So we called it judo bank. I rang up your wife. Are we family members? And ask them about the opportunity cost that you made the call on. Yep. What would they say? Uh, well, they, they'll say hand on heart that I, I was working too hard and that, and that I made trade-offs, that I should have been more visible in family affairs than I was. That I would expect them to say that. I don't think I've been a, um, and I'm being honest here, I've not been a good contributor in a family sense. I mean, I, I've, I've been there and I've done... Yeah, I, and part of it, part of it was the way I was brought up. Because as I said earlier, I was brought up in a working class family, and the role of the father was to provide the means to work hard and bring home the money yep. that the family then survived on. And in those days, you know, the, there wasn't a lot of the choices that we have today. But I, I had this old fashioned view in life that the primary role of the man in the family was the breadwinner. But of course, in the modern world or the right world, that, that's not enough. So the criticism that would be made, fair criticism, is that I've, I've been too absent and too focused on judo bank uh, at the expense of other things. Not proud of that, but I think being honest is very important. Fair enough. But didn't you give me some advice years ago? You could be selfish. You gotta, uh, you, uh, you and gotta, that's a different form of yeah, language, isn't it? Yeah, I, I do believe in being selfish, but not not to the detriment of other people. Yeah. I think there's a big difference here. I mean, everybody that, that I know and people that I've read about that have been successful have been very selfish. They've worked hard. I mean, very few people are successful yep. in business or sport or in the arts yep. without sheer hard work. And and that comes at a, at a cost. Now, yep. I would always encourage selfishness, but not not to the detriment of other people. When I say selfishness, as I would say, work hard on being good at what you do. I've always believed that in order to look after others, you've got to look after yourself. Uh, if you're if you're emotionally or mentally exhausted, if you're uh, not feeling good about yourself, and we all go through those phases in life, you're not in a position to help anybody. And so, my sense of focus on yourself, be the best you can be, be as happy as you can be, work as hard as you can. Put yourself first, because then you can look after other people. If you don't put yourself first and you're feeling not feeling good about things, you're not well placed to look after other, other people. So that's what I mean by selfish. There might be a better way of framing that, but I, 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 too often I've seen people that sacrifice themselves for the benefit of others and it doesn't end up in a happy place. All right, Joseph, one bad scenario. Any get taken out? Is judo going to get picked up? Well, judo is a public company. I know, which means she's up for sale every day of every the week. Every day of the week. I, I don't want, and, and its share price today is not anywhere near reflecting the fact that miles away from it. But I would hate that to happen personally. I mean, obviously, as a CEO of a company, I'll, I'll always act in the interests of shareholders, but so I'm putting on a personal hat here. Mm. I feel that the growth in front of judo is enormous. I think we're still, a, we're still a young company. We've proven that the formula that we have developed works. 
that we're growing and we're profitable. We've got high staff engagement, high customer engagement. We're not going to change that formula. I want Judo to be in 10 years time, at least 10 times bigger than it is today. But it'll never, ever, ever drift away from the reason that we set it up. And I'm very disciplined on that. That I'm a great believer, and it goes back to football. You know, I was good, but not great. Work at what you're good at and try to be great at it. Maybe I kind of self-taught myself out of that, but don't try to be all things to all people. Say that I'm good at doing this and just constantly work and work and work and work and work at being great at doing it. And then I think everything looks after itself. So you start life off saying that being specialist is a good thing and then you go on a long journey and then 30 years later you end up saying actually <laughs> that was not a bad idea in the first place. Joseph, if you're going to look back at that young man maybe standing in the sheds on that Friday or Saturday and Sir Alex walked up and had a few words to you, what advice would you give him now? The next 90 minutes, treat them as the most important 90 minutes in your life in your football life. Leave everything on the park, I should say. Come back in here exhausted. Come back in here and look at your teammates and say, I gave everything I could possibly have given. You might have won the game. You might have lost the game. But don't leave this potentially life transforming, as it could have been, because there were lots of scouts from big clubs there. Uh, don't leave this potentially life transforming 90 minutes with any regrets. Do your best. On that, Joseph, thank you for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure, Greg. Thank you. You've been listening to No Limitations.